Throughout history, city dwellers have had their problems. Gardu! In 1422, one William Wood was hauled before the magistrates and fined. For throwing horrible filth onto your highway to the great discomfort of your neighbors. By the 16th century, things had improved. Instead of ordure being thrown from windows, it was dumped in front of neighboring houses. Shakespeare's father got caught and fined for this in 1551. A hundred years later, Lady Castlemaine encouraged King Charles II to complain to the city fathers about the disgusting state of the streets. But, ironically, it took disaster to bring relief. In 1666, Samuel Pepys wrote, as he watched the Great Fire of London, A most horrid, malicious, bloody flame. It made me weep to see it. But it did burn up the refuse of the centuries, as well as the rats which infested it. But things were soon as bad as ever. This notorious heap of refuse in Gray's Inn Lane remained into the 19th century when it was shipped to Russia to make bricks to repair Napoleon's damage to Moscow. Even in 1832, an outraged citizen wrote to the Times. Sir, the streets near Westminster Abbey are contaminated by a herd of swine feeding off the garbage and living in disgusting dens near Gardner's Lane. Scavengers are hardly ever seen here and refuse lies decaying in the streets. Finally, grim outbreaks of cholera in London in the middle of the century led to the Public Health Act of 1875. This marked the beginning of regular door-to-door -door collection of household refuse which has continued to be the responsibility of London's local government ever since. Londoners now have as advanced a refuse collection service as any in the world, and borough councils continually search for even better techniques. Since 1965, the handling of London's refuse has been carried out in partnership. The boroughs collect it, and the Greater London Council disposes of it. But for both, the problem is vast, as higher living standards and modern packaging continue to create more and more refuse. There are at present two basic ways of disposing of rubbish. It can be incinerated, thus enormously reducing its bulk. But old incinerators like this are inefficient, while modern ones are very costly. Alternatively, rubbish can be spread onto waste or derelict land to reclaim it for useful life. The economics of both methods are complicated by the increasing distances of suitable landfill sites. Thank you. 
Greater London's population is about 7 million, producing some 30 million cubic meters of refuse yearly. But only these boroughs are economically able to deliver their refuse direct to landfill sites. These Thameside boroughs have river transfer stations, from which refuse is removed by barges working for the GLC. These red areas are served by the small incinerators taken over by the GLC as well as by the great modern incinerator they built at Edmonton in Enfield. But most London boroughs, less conveniently situated, have to have road transfer stations. And that, briefly, is the disposal complex required for London's vast flood of garbage. Let's see how it all works out in practice. First, river transport. This has always been cheaper than road, and refuse has been moved down the Thames since the Middle Ages. But there's nothing medieval about this ultra-modern barge transfer station at Kringle Dock. Here, 800 tonnes of refuse can pass over the Weybridge every day. Collection vehicles discharge their loads into hoppers. Dust extractors ensure good ventilation and reasonable working conditions. As the whole area is almost completely enclosed, no nuisance is caused outside. From the hoppers, hydraulic rams push the refuse into large bunkers. Grabs and conveyors then take it to giant pulverizers. More conveyors take the now pulverized refuse to telescopic chutes which deliver it straight to the barges with the minimum of dust. Kringle Dock, despite its size, fits pleasantly enough into the riverside sea. On every tide, barges are moved from dock to tideway in the traditional manner before setting off down London River. Past Chelsea, Big Ben and the Houses of Parliament. Past the County Hall, headquarters of the Greater London Council on the South Bank. Finally to Raynham on the low-lying Essex shore, where the pulverised refuse from Kringle Dock turns useless marshy ground to eventual good use. 
as we are chronically short of land in Britain, every acre we can thus create has a double value. The high percentage of paper in refuse emphasizes that greater efforts are needed to reclaim it, for every ton of waste paper recycled saves 17 trees. The GLC offers financial encouragement to London Borough Councils to develop paper salvage in their refuse collections. For boroughs some distance from the river, it is more economical to provide road transfer stations. Most existing stations are simple in design. This one handles some 300 tons a day. platform, refuse is bulldozed through an opening, falls into a compression chamber and is thence forced into bulk carriers. Compressed to two-thirds its original bulk, it is then transported to landfill sites. About 80% of London's refuse is disposed of for land reclamation, mostly via the transfer stations. However, there are areas where pressure on transport facilities makes incineration the best answer. So the GLC has built the largest and most modern incinerator in Europe, here at Edmonton. It cost over 12 million pounds. Up this ramp every year come half a million tons of raw refuse to be reduced to something like one quarter of this weight in the form of hygienic clinker, ash and ferrous scrap. From his vantage point high above the apron, the controller indicates the bay to which each vehicle must go to discharge. When our hopper is full, the controller empties it into one of the huge bunkers from which the furnaces are fed seven days a week. Day and night, grabs lift refuse from the bunkers, each the size of a block of flats, and drop it down chutes into the furnaces.
The furnaces are controlled from this firing aisle. They burn at about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, at which great heat they consume all their own smoke. High pressure steam from the boilers drives four turbo generators, which pass enough electricity into the national grid to supply 60,000 homes. Surplus heat is dissipated in these cooling towers, which draw their water from the effluent channel of the nearby sewage treatment works. After quenching, clinker, ash and scrap from the furnaces pass up the conveyor to the residuals plant where the ferrous metal is magnetically separated, baled and sold as second grade scrap, over 18,000 tons of it a year. Clinker and fly ash are separated and disposed of for road making and also as a fill for waste land. The hot gases are virtually dust free. They are shot into the atmosphere at 50 miles an hour, so avoiding contamination. But much still remains to be done, as you can see from this old incinerator. Although progress since 1965 has been substantial, unhygienic old river transfer stations need to be replaced by up-to-date plants like Kringle Dock. Obsolete road transfer stations too will need reconstruction. But modern designs are coming forward. This is a model of a large station at Newham for handling 700 tonnes of refuse daily. Further developments will include rail transfer stations with liner trains, which will go direct to worked out excavations outside London to restore them to useful land. This will also keep more heavy vehicles off the roads. London, like other large cities, has problems with indiscriminately dumped refuse. To encourage the public to help tackle this problem, the GLC provides 50 sites to which anyone can bring old furniture, refrigerators, waste oil and the like for free disposal. This is another special problem, which hardly existed before the 50s. It would be less of one if more car owners were public-spirited enough not to dump their old bangers in the street, but to take or send them to one of the many London depots to which derelict cars can be delivered.
Some of these depots are regularly visited by a mobile bailer, a monster which will take your car and shrink it before your eyes into a neat little cube. Engine, seats, body, wheels, the lot. She is believed to be the only lady in the business. Married with two children, she says it's more a matter of knack than muscle. Because of contamination, bailed cars don't produce the best strap. So the Greater London Council sends some of the 40,000 old cars collected in London every year to this plant, the first of its kind in Europe, where they are turned into uncontaminated scrap. A merciful curtain hides the old faithfuls as they drop 40 feet onto the hammers of the disintegrator. Only minutes later they emerge as little bits of aluminium, copper and zinc, as first-class scrap for steel making and as a little cloud of dust. Meanwhile, all round London, ugly scars are being hidden, waste ground reclaimed. Initially, the refuse is spread in layers, up to six feet thick after settling. Each layer is given a nine inch coating of soil or ash and bulldozers pack everything down. The ground can be flat or pleasantly contoured. It all takes some time to settle down, but eventually with topsoil added, new farm or parkland will have been created out of derelict waste ground and unwanted refuse. Twenty years ago, this pleasant scene was a disused gravel pit. And this is really the key to the whole task, and to the way it is being tackled, using the refuse of today for the benefit of tomorrow. It's the job of the London Borough Councils and of the GLC to get refuse safely away from London's homes and streets, and dispose of it to the best advantage of us all. Together, the Greater London Council and the Borough Councils help to protect our environment and create new land out of your load of old rubbish. <laughs>